let's get right back to our conversation with Bill Tompkins and uh, pick it up and move on. Is there some way to establish mental parity with ETs that we could combine our brain and theirs in terms of research and, and get anything accomplished? I mean, I, well, you, you would I, think I, of I'm an ET to, yeah. as being so far ahead of us that there would be no, no hope. Uh, that, that's what, what you'd I'm think. What I'm trying to say is that, that has been going now for some 40 years, okay? Right. So uh, our, our learning curve... Uh, uh, being controlled uh, by the uh, essentially by Draco's uh, reducing our mental capability to about ninety-five uh, percent. So the the reptilians are reducing our mental capabilities. Are others enhancing our mental capabilities? It is said we have far more brain power than we average, on average, access. Well, the number is 2.3% is all you're using. And uh, this is because, essentially, you're smoking their pot because they drop this stuff on all of us. And uh, some people's brains react to it and don't accept it, don't accept the gases. Right. And, uh, but uh, the the human species that are on this planet have an unbelievable brain capability to accomplish unbelievable things. Mm -hmm. But uh, we're not being allowed to use that brain. Interesting. And, and so, you say the Draco reptilians are the ones keeping us back from utilizing. Uh, far more of our intellectual prowess than we are. Yes. Now, the Nordics, on the other hand, are pushing you all the time. The difficulty is that the Nordic naval battle groups are, like we said before, if we have 10 of them, they have 50 of them. So it's like a numbers game. And, they, they, you talk, wait, wait. We have 10, who's we, and who's they that have 50? If we have 10, they have 50. The reptilians have 50 to our 10? Yes. And so uh, when we talk about Solar Warden, uh, actually the, the number there is, is 8, but I just, just used the word 10. Okay, uh, that's fine. But, but uh, what we're trying to say is that for the Nordics to get through the block uh, and get through the block that is located around the solar system. Okay. Uh, and they have to essentially go in underneath the table. Okay. So they have to sneak in <laughs> and, and there was yeah, the reptilians have, have kind of blocked off our solar system. Uh, obviously it's, it's not terribly hard for the Nordics to get in uh, or they would be destroyed. So they get in, yes. uh, where they have some stealth technology, whatever, and they get here, and now they're helping, trying to help us advance intellectually. What, what, are the tools, what are the tools that the Nordics use? You mentioned that the reptilians are dropping gas in the atmosphere and we're all inhaling it, and it is stunting us or regressing us. What are the Nordics doing? What is their technology like? that is used okay. to enhance human intellect. Okay. They're doing exactly what the three did um, at the Douglas Apollo program. Uh, they don't have the masses to come here and teach everybody. But they are taking individuals, they are taking people, and telepathically assisting them technically. Mm -hmm. And uh, so this is not a hard thing to do, but if you don't have numbers, uh -huh. it becomes a major task. I understand. It's a one-on-one -on -one kind of a thing, or relatively speaking, instead of a mass uh, gassing, so to speak, that uh, does retard the, the brain process. And boy, can we see that in our society now. We're going the wrong way. I don't want to blame the reptilians always, but uh, 
it wouldn't surprise me. Something's up. Something's up. I, you know, I had, I had, let me ask you a question. I, when I was a young youngster, oh, I was 12, uh, somebody came to my uh, high school uh, and I was called to the office. And the, the secretary there said, uh, hello, and thank you for coming to the office. There's a, a man here, Professor such and such, who wants to talk to you. And I said, not much, because I was kind of shy at 12. And, and I said, oh, okay. And she said, well, here he is, and, and follow, follow us. We're going to go down the hall. And so she led the way. I walked, and this man walked behind me. And I noticed he was very tall, very thin, had little thin mouth, kind of thin eyes, horizontally thin, and an and th- aquiline nose, and had black horn rim glasses on, and had a, a briefcase. Uh, and he must have been six foot three, six foot four, which is quite tall. Anyway, we went in a room, and she said, "Okay, uh, thank you very much, uh, Jeffrey, and uh, uh, Doctor Such and Such will talk to you." I don't, I don't know how long we were in that room. Uh, he asked me an awful lot of questions. A lot. Like what kind of a question? He had a yellow legal pad, and he was writing. <clears throat> and he wrote and wrote and wrote when I would talk. Questions like, uh, what do you see yourself doing in life later on? And I'm 12 years old. I didn't, I didn't even think about that. And I said, without thinking... I see myself talking to a lot of people, trying to help them with their lives and to live better lives. And I remember that quote, and because I don't know where it came from, he wrote that down, and then he said, and what, this is at the end of, I don't know how long, two hours? He said, what do you want to be remembered for? That was the last question he asked me. And I won't tell you what I said, but it was a very strange meeting. I have no idea who this fellow was or what he what he came from, where he came from. But I've always had the feeling I've been watched my whole life. And I just wanted to ask you if this had anything to do with anything you're familiar with, because you're familiar with a lot of very eccentric material. Okay, let, let me just say that uh, that's... That's not, uh, that's happening all the time. And, uh, that, that individual probably was a Nordic, uh, and for whatever reason you had been selected. And, uh, that did, uh, he did implement information into your head, uh, telepathically during the time that you talked with him. Yeah, that and, wouldn't uh, surprise me because I don't remember. I don't remember the, the, the time we sat there. I mean, I wasn't unconscious, but it was kind of just wiped, except for the last two or three questions. It was strange. Um, I think that uh, if we could do it, I, I'd, like to, I'd like to talk about another person who had essentially the same type of thing happen to him. Sure. And uh, I'm going to do this and... and I want you to think about uh, your experience. All right. Okay? Mm-hmm. All right. Now, this fellow, his name is Joe Papp, and he's from one of the uh, European Eastern countries. Okay. And he came over to the United States, uh, I guess, in the 60s. And uh, he had uh, an approach which... Uh, could be used by Detroit, uh, which would not require the use of gasoline. Mm -hmm. And uh, so he took this approach, and he went to Detroit, and he tried to talk to different companies. He just kept trying to go to different different, uh, automobile companies with his proposal. So he left Detroit, and he came out to LAX. And this was like 69, 68 Mm -hmm. uh, time period. Mm -hmm. And uh, he got enough publicity that uh, Northrop, uh, Lockheed, uh, Douglas, uh, 
GRW, uh, most of the aerospace companies and some of the uh, uh, advanced research, uh, medical research people, came to a parking lot at one of the smaller facilities uh, in the LAX uh, airport area. So he had a demonstration, and uh, he, uh, he had a, a four-cylinder Crosley engine, and what he was going to do was to show he could run it without having to put gasoline into the uh, to the tank. And uh, so the fellow from uh, 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 my understanding it was Caltech, but I've heard more recently it was JPL. But anyway, uh, he uh, he didn't believe. Joe Papp was doing what he was said he was doing because Joe Papp had an instrument, instrument uh, box to control the engine, and he had that plugged in to electrical power in an outlet uh, next to a building in the parking lot. So this fellow came over, over to Joe and said uh, some profanity, you're not doing what you're saying. And they went over to pull the plug, and Joe had sort of a fight with him, and the guy managed to pull the plug. Well, the engine went, uh, uh, the engine blew up, and it blew a four-inch hole in the stomach of uh, the TRW Propulsion Systems Assistant Section Chief. And so he, uh, we were all standing at a chain link fence watching this. And so he just sort of sank down, and of course it killed him. You uh, were there and you saw all this? Uh, yes. And I went myself to security at the RW. And I said, I got to, uh, I have a man that's got to be protected. And uh, we took him and all of his stuff and over to one of the labs at the RW, Redondo Beach. And uh, then we got a hold of his uh, wife, and uh, they, uh, the guy that was the head of security was an ex-FBI uh, guy, and a uh, real smart guy. And so he set up what was essentially a protection-type thing for Joe Papp and his wife, and I think the other, his son. And uh, they set up a place which they could live. And uh, so we had Joe Papp for a little less than three years. And, oh, I forgot to tell you, uh, one of a friend, friend of mine at TRW uh, was... Uh, staff for the job of uh, studying Joe Papp and what he could do. So I, I, didn't, I, I didn't run the show, but he did. And I did help getting other labs to uh, come in at different times and witness different studies. And essentially, we took every type of, of uh, internal combustion engine you could think of, all the way up to big diesel ship engines and... Uh, 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 diesel uh, railroad engines and every type. And uh, so we tested his system on all these different engines and uh, we came to the conclusion that uh, what he was saying was correct and that the system really worked, which essentially would, uh, you'd just put H2O, or they, they put water in the tank and uh, essentially put, uh, uh, if it's six cylinder, essentially it puts six uh, aspirin in the carburetor or whatever, and uh, you could get 100,000 miles out of it. Now, let's, let's yeah. hold on, uh, Bill. Let me do this for our listeners. I remember the name Joe Papp. I've heard about him before. He was a free energy guy. Uh, this goes back. Let me read one little thing here about Joe uh, this is very interesting, and I think it will help all of our listeners focus in on this even more. You were there. I can't, this is really astonishing. In 1967, Joseph Papp, 
built a modified Volvo engine, 1967, to run on a sealed charge of noble gases in the cylinders. It was publicly demonstrated in Los Angeles in 1968, a year later. The engine controls were run on 110 VAC wall current through an extension cord. Richard Feynman attended, very famous physicist, and pulled the plug. The engine continued to run for several minutes, but began running rough. Papp took away the plug from Feynman and plugged it back in. But the engine exploded. One person was killed. Feynman accused Papp of using explosives to deliberately destroy the engine to keep the supposed hoax alive. Papp sued Feynman and Caltech, and Caltech settled out of court in Papp's favor. If explosives were used, Caltech would never have settled out of court. Joe Papp died in 1989. Tell us more. We have just a few minutes left. This is remarkable. Okay, so uh, almost three years was spent uh, proving the system. And uh, uh, we set up, uh, I forget, like four or five different companies, uh, which would be subsidiaries of DRW, to, uh, to handle uh, different types of uh, uh, clients that would be using... Uh, Truck engines, uh, yes. diesel locomotives, yes. uh, ship engines, and all this type of thing. We, had, we were setting up companies. We were organizing companies to do this. And uh, so, uh, oh, I forgot to tell you, they uh, they made me manager of this, okay? And uh, this other fellow had other things to do, so I sort of took over after most of it was done at the end of it. Right. And uh, so the Joe Papp engine system. And so uh, uh, I come in Monday morning, and I have these green sheets uh, uh, on all the different programs I'm working on, uh, studies. And uh, so then I have all the green sheets for the Joe Pep uh, uh, companies now that were, we were going to be using, utilizing this for. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, my green sheets are like, 20 pages normally, and one page comes out Monday morning. I go to my boss. He said, well, you've got to go talk to the uh, president. So uh, I call the president's office, and because uh, I'd never met him. And uh, so uh, the girl said uh, on, the, on the phone after she gave me his secretary, she said, uh, uh, can you make it in uh, about 10 minutes, Bill? I don't know her. She doesn't know me, I didn't think, anyway. And so uh, all I had to do was go over to the other building from my office. So I could do it in 10 minutes. So anyway, I go up there, and I'm waiting and waiting. And uh, then he, uh, he comes out, greets me, and we go in his office. And, of course, I tell him what I want to know what the hell's going. And he said, uh, uh, we can't do anything about it, Bill. Uh, they own 53%. Who owns 53%? Exactly. Your own companies. Oh, my. Now, the same thing. Wait a minute. Now, they're not, not, they're not finished here. Mm -hmm. Okay. So, this other fellow, a sweet guy, that's the head of security at TRW. That's probably... Todd, a, please uh, the turn the music secure. off. We're going to have to continue. Uh, go ahead, Bill. Uh, that, uh, this situation was to the level of free energy, okay? Now, the, the guy that's director of security at TRW One Space Park, Redondo Beach, he takes me to the side and he said, Bill, you're number 30. 30 of what? 30 different systems have, have been developed and proven to work which require no gasoline, hmm. no oil, since World War II. Well, you can see why they, they terrorized poor Joe Papp in Detroit. He threatened the entire industry, the petroleum industry, the auto industry, to see all the automobile America. subcontractors, everything. Wow. Wow. Anyway, uh, I, I just have to say, uh, you know, I quit 
KRW. I resigned. A whole bunch of other people resigned because this was the, the last straw with them. They knew yeah. about all these other systems. I didn't know all the other systems that had been removed. So many. But, uh, mm -hmm. uh, and uh, actually, Crumman, like I said before, a few years later, Crumman bought TRW and all the space system stuff, all the advanced medical systems. They bought the uh, extended life system, the whole ball of wax, mm -hmm. did, with mm -hmm. no Detroit involved, period. Now, this is Northrop. Who, who bought it? Northrop or Grumman? Northrop Grumman. Northrop Grumman bought it. Okay. All right. Now, wow. we're just about out of time, uh, okay. Bill, uh, for this visit. But what should I have learned from this vis-a-vis -vis my experience with the, the strange man who talked okay. to me? The, the thing is that he was, and when he talked about how he learned this, he had this tall man. Oh. And he had the two tall girls. They were beautiful people. Three people told him to leave Europe, go to the United States, implement this. Wow. Uh, wow. Pretty amazing story. All right, we're going to pick this up next time, uh, Bill, and carry on from where we are. Uh, the okay. Joe Papp story was, was remarkable, and there was a tall man in his life, too. Mm. Yes, sir. Yeah. All right. Well, thank you. I don't you. like you. Uh, wow. Well, nothing would surprise me. We'll talk more about this next visit, Bill. Thank you very much for being here thank again. Thank you. My okay. privilege. You thank take you. care. All right. Good night. Right. Mr. Bill Tompkins, our latest conversation and... We always learn things when Bill is around. Amazing. That's quite a story about Joe Papp and his tall man. All right, we'll look into that more next time. Back in a few minutes. Hang on.